I just finished Herman Melville's Clarel, a book that I've tried to work through many times, uh, and honestly, I have no idea where to begin. Clarel is an epic poem by Herman Melville, author, of course, of Moby Dick and other fun novels like Pierre or Marty or uh, The Confidence Man and short stories you probably read in high school like Bartleby the Scrivener. I would prefer not to, you know. But what's not as well known from Herman Melville is his poetry, which after the immensely negative reception of his later novels like Moby Dick and The Confidence Man, he turned to poetry, writing a string of Civil War poems that are very expansive and cover many of the battles and characters and events for throughout the American Civil War. Uh, and then he actually quit writing for the most part, and he became a customs house officer and worked as a government agent, basically. And during that time, in the late 1860s and early 1870s, he was working on a bit of a passion project, a poem that he would ultimately publish himself that did not sell well and was not really regarded at all during its uh, lifetime, during Melville's lifetime. And that work is Clarel, an 18,000 line epic poem about uh, a plethora of people going throughout the Holy Land. So what is Clarel about? Well, it's easy enough to say what it's about, but it probably wouldn't sell anyone on wanting to read it. It's about a young theology student named Clarel who is uh, in the Holy Land, and he decides uh, to go on a bit of a journey and wander through the Holy Land, looking at relics, exploring the, the, the nature around him, the barren desert. And what you quickly pick up on is that this is not a epic poem of plot. This is an epic poem of ideas, specifically theological ideas, intermixed with themes of sexuality, death, longing, despair. And it drones on. This is a droning poem, and I honestly love it for that. <laughs> its length serves its theme well. Um, what you get from the poem is essentially a collection of dialogues, a collection of interactions between characters with vastly different beliefs. Clairol, uh, if I had to sum him up briefly, is essentially a very troubled Christian, I would say, someone who is wavering between faith and doubt right on the line, and, and he hopes that by exploring the Holy Land, by visiting relics, he will uh, revive his faith. There are other characters, though, like the kind of passionate Anglican priest Dervant, to the melancholic fanatic Mortmain, to the kind of older, wiser, agnostic, but leaning on the side of Christianity Rolf, to the quiet and uh, off-putting and skeptical Vine. All of these characters people have written about as being inspired by both Herman Melville himself and Herman Melville's friends, but ultimately I think if you go in without any of that knowledge you'll find that what you're presented with is a great dialogue of characters who are all interacting with each other. However, it's important to know that these characters don't really learn anything from each other. It's a lot of arguing and going back and forth, and, and if every moment you think Melville might offer some sort of agreement or a moment when the characters might learn something and have an epiphany um, that never happens. This is a poem, I would say, that's about the agony of agnosticism, which is interesting to compare it to Moby Dick. So in Moby Dick, we have Ishmael, who is very playful, very charismatic, and plays with blasphemous ideas, agnosticism, the inability of knowing things for certain. Uh, I love the quote from Ishmael, doubts of all things earthly, intuitions of some things heavenly. This makes neither believer nor infidel, but a man who regards both with equal eye. What we have in Clarel is people who regard both with equal eye and then suffer for it. So it's a very different rhetoric that Melville presents. But what is the style like? Well, it's written in these very terse eight syllable lines that have kind of a random rhyme scheme. It can go A, A, B, B, or A, B, A, B. Uh, he kind of switches it up. There are also songs throughout the poem that kind of switch up the rhyme scheme and the uh, meter a bit, but for the most part, Melville just sticks to this very strict, terse, eight-syllable per line style. Another way I would sum up this poem is like the Canterbury Tales without the tales. It's just like, imagine a bunch of people traveling and instead of telling engaging and funny or uh, moving stories, they're talking about their internal struggles with faith and what they believe. And this makes for a very, again, droning read in that nothing really happens. Uh, sure, they go places, they see things, but everything they see and engage with offers an opportunity for them not to entertain the reader per se or entertain each other, but more to argue with one another. 
and explore what they believe. Melville actually makes this connection between them in the Canterbury Tales. Melville writes, Not from brave Chaucer's tabard inn they pictured wend, scarce shall they win fair Kent and Canterbury ken, nor Franklin squire nor Morris dance of wit and story good as then, another age and other men, and life and unfulfilled romance. And basically what he's saying there, right, is that uh, because of the cultural shifts, and many critics will point out uh, Darwinism is a huge influence on the faith-doubt crisis that happened in the late 19th century in the English-speaking world, Melville's arguing, look, these aren't medieval pilgrims who uh, are just going to tell stories. These are troubled modern people who are going to share their troubled, tortured minds with each other. And that is precisely what you get. There is a bit of a romance plot here where Clarell falls in love with a Jewish girl, Ruth, but he's not allowed to be engaged because he's not Jewish. Uh, so he decides to leave and that creates another problem for uh, Clarell. As he explores the wilderness, he meets many men and he begins to feel fraternal slash erotic bonds for them. And he doesn't know how to feel about that because obviously he has his heart with this girl, Ruth, back in Jerusalem. And uh, basically Melville explores, again, that theme of sexuality that comes up in Moby Dick, only this time it's much more agonizing. Again, Moby Dick, you have the squeeze of the hand in which everyone's squeezing sperm and lovingly holding each other. You have Queequeg and Ishmael with their wedding bed and the very cute uh, romantic um, intimacy that they share. All of that's gone here. Any sort of uh, homoerotic bond that is created in Clarell is tortuous. And uh, Melville explores the kind of negative side of homosexuality or homoeroticism in the 19th century. Although this has similarities to the Canterbury Tales without the tales, and it has a kind of Dante-esque exploring, seeing things and meditating on them, this is ultimately like nothing else I've ever read. Um, and again, maybe that just might attest to my lack of epic poem knowledge. Uh, but from what I've read in American literature, from what I've read of Melville, uh, there isn't really much like this. And, and that kind of begs the question, why is this poem so unpopular? Why does no one talk about it? And I think there are a few reasons. One, it is a difficult poem. I found myself really struggling and I was able to find actually a really helpful academic guide that kind of goes through the cantos in each characters because uh, there are a lot and it's a lot to keep track of. So I think difficulty has one part to do with it. Another part of it is that it's long. Uh, another thing is that uh, if you're gonna study Melville, it makes sense to just study Moby Dick and the short stories and get on with it. All that to say though, I think that Clarell is a incredibly unique and beautiful poem, although it has a very specific audience. Uh, and that kind of begs the question then, you know, who is this poem for, right? Like Melville himself said, I don't have the quote with me, but he said that this poem was doomed to be unreadable. And many critics uh, that I've read kind of agree, like this is a, an almost unreadable poem in its difficulty, its scope, and its kind of meandering, droning nature. But I think if you're anyone who's interested in the Victorian faith doubt crisis in the late 19th century, if you're interested in Herman Melville or American literature, if you're interested in people really struggling to know themselves, this is a very, if I may say so, existential poem in which people want to ground their existence in something and they don't want to be uh, essentially defined by something else. They all want to make their way and believe what they want to believe and make who they are through their actions yet they all repeatedly fail and do a horrible job at doing so. The overwhelming pessimism in the poem is probably another reason why it's not taught or widely read. And again, finally, a more material reason why the poem is not read is that it's kind of hard to get your hands on. I have the Library of America edition, which I did a video on before, uh, and I can link other editions, but this is like not an easy poem to just find. You don't walk into a bookstore and find Clarel, uh, nor do you find it for cheap. So <laughs> another thing to keep in mind. Perhaps most impressive in this poem is that Melville draws on so many religious beliefs and histories. Uh, I, there are some notes in the back of this edition, um, but they do not cover nearly all the allusions and um, the depths of knowledge that Melville possesses. He talks about things that you will be surprised to see in an American poem from the 19th century. His vast, expansive knowledge of Hinduism, Buddhism, even Gnosticism, which I'll read a passage of right now. Melville writes, 
"'Twas averred that in old Gnostic pages blurred, Jehovah was construed to be author of evil, yea, it's God, and Christ divine is contrary. A God was held against a God, but Christ revered alone. Herefrom, if inference availeth aught, for still the topic pressed they home, the twofold testaments became transmitters of Chaldaic thought by implication. If no more those Gnostic heretics prevail which shook the East from shore to shore, their strife forgotten now in pale, yet with their sex that old revolved now reappears, if in assault less frank. None say Jehovah's evil, none gainsay that he bears the rod, scarce that, but there's dismission civil, and Jesus is the indulgent God. Again, how Melville knew so much about Gnosticism and was able to connect it with how Protestant Christians view Christianity is uh, quite a marvel. To give people a sense of what some critics think, I've pulled up a book called Melville and the Intersympathy of Creeds, which I was told is kind of a good introduction scholarly work that goes over the uh, reception to the poem throughout the ages. Uh, this is just a few things that critics have said about Clarell. Uh, one scholar says, Clarell is practically unreadable because of Melville's inexplicable choice of rhyme tetrameter as the medium for philosophic meditation. Another critic writes, What we miss in Clarell is the jocular seriousness of Moby Dick, where the ideas of the great thinkers were a convenient grist for the buoyant imagination. So yeah, critics have not always been super defending of this poem. Um, but one scholar who actually did a, a highly praised uh, academic edition of Clarell, Walter E. Benzanzen, I'm not, probably not saying that right, Benzanzen, uh, he wrote, one can dislike the cramping effect of endless octosyllabic lines inevitably linked to one to the other, as a good share of the critics do, but there can be no question of the appropriateness. It is an essential part of the poem that the verse form is constricting and bounded, that the basic movements are tight, hard, and constricting. The tragedy of modern man, as Melville now viewed it, was one of constriction. I couldn't agree more with that assessment. The style of the poem, again, is droning. It's so repetitive. It, it, it kind of knocks you down. Um, but I think it captures very much what these characters are going through. They're constricted. They can't express themselves well. And Melville gives all these characters their beautiful due. Another good way to look at it is something that Robert Penn Warren said in his collected, uh, an introduction to a collected edition of Melville's poems. He says that the shifting chiaroscuro of beliefs and doctrines presented in the poem, none of which is privileged, but all of which are heard. Uh, which is a very good way to think of this poem. Melville, you never get the sense that he agrees with all these characters or privileges one over the other. They all have a unique voice. They're all interacting with each other and they all teach us things that we can learn from. Again, it's very hard to boil down Clarell into a video. Um, and if this is a review, well, I guess I would have to say, try it out. It's not for everyone, but I think uh, it's absolutely beautiful, uh, completely stirring. It is a monomaniacal work. It is an obsessive work. You get the sense that Melville was truly obsessed with religious history, um, mythology, and wanting to finally solve the faith doubt crisis, um, which he ultimately does not do. And for that reason, I, I strongly recommend Clarell, although I have to admit it is a deeply pessimistic, sad, um, tortuous poem. It's the, it's a poem of a tortured mind, and uh, it stands out because I don't think anyone else in the 19th century was doing anything like what Melville was doing here. But at the same time, it, it feels so tortured, it feels so hopeless and painful, um, that it, it's difficult to recommend just blithely, you know, just like, hey, go read Clarell if you like Melville. Um, if, if you're someone who likes Herman Melville, but you've only read Moby Dick, try out his other novels, try out some of his shorter poetry, and if you really want to do the deep dive, then go into Clarell. Um, and I don't say that to ward people off or scare them, um, because it, it, at the end of the day, it's a poem that people can read. You know, it's, 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 it's a difficult poem, but it's not this impossible tome of literature that will block anyone trying to understand it. Um, I think it's an important work, and I, I hope, and uh, I doubt this will happen, but I hope that time will be kind to this poem, and that we will begin to see it as kind of the American epic poem, because I believe that is precisely what Melville has delivered here, an American epic um, that explores so many different facets of the human uh, condition, really. Anyway, I hope you enjoy. Uh, have you read Clarell? Have you read um, other late works by Melville? What do you think? I'd love to know. I'll put some links to guides, books, editions uh, that hopefully people will find helpful. Anyway strongly recommend. I'm very glad I read it. And uh, yeah, take it easy.